advocates, it's Elizabeth from Namapa. Just wanted to let you guys know, we are looking for content and speakers for upcoming webinars and our conference later this year. If you want to share your passion, share your reason why, or share a topic that you think would be valuable to advocates everywhere, please get in touch with us. All right, so starting the new year, uh, previously we've spoken to you guys about the end of the year and how to prepare for this. And now we're finally here, the big, bright, shiny new year. There are a lot of things that come with this, you know, turn of the calendar. So we want to help you lay the foundation to be able to navigate this whole process. The new year is a great time to get organized while embracing the chaos. The more proactive you can be with your practice or facility in the first few weeks, the easier the rest of the year should go. A main focus in the new year for medication access should be determining if the patient has active insurance coverage. Spending time to verify coverage will prevent headaches further along in the revenue cycle and help to alleviate unwanted surprises to the patient. Here are a few tips to help you get started on the right or left foot. Go through your active patient list. If you do not have a list of patients, this is a great time to make one. Check charts of each of your patient for their last injection or infusion, their last appointment with a provider, and make sure they have an appointment for their next administration setup. If they haven't been in or aren't scheduled, this is the time to reach out and speak to the patient to see how they are and assist them in getting scheduled. Patient assistance can change on the calendar year or from time of registration. Make sure patients have active copay cards or have reapplied for grants if needed. Grant funding sometimes rolls over the first of the year, but it will run out quickly. Patients who need assistance should reapply right away. You can always reach out to manufacturer hubs and ask about assistance for your patients and navigating the process. Make sure prescriptions are up to date with specialty pharmacies to prevent a delay in shipping. Make sure the pharmacy has an up-to-date demographics, authorization, and any copay assistance information. Have a procedure in place for checking eligibility before medication administrations. Review that process in place for verifying and asking a patient for any updated insurance. Clean and organize the fridge. Check for any expired medications or duplicates. Go through all boxes, bags, containers, shelves, drawers, in any and all locations your medications are stored. Make sure all buy and bill products are accounted for and inventory is recorded appropriately. Any patients who have stopped therapy can have their product reallocated if it is buy and bill to keep inventory levels low. A good checklist for January. Verify eligibility two days prior to an appointment, injection or infusion. Check referral status if a referral is required. When the patient comes in for their first appointment of the year, verify their demographics, make sure it is accurate and up to date, including but not limited to their name, insurance, primary, secondary, tertiary, employer, guarantor, address, and telephone number of each. Scan copies of all provided cards into a practice management or EHR system. Verify that the active insurance ID is listed on any prior authorization before any medication is administered. Any changes in the patient's information should immediately be communicated and administration delayed or samples provided to the patient if an authorization is required. Verify patient's copay card or grant assistance. If needed, ask the patient to reapply or submit documentation for approval. Our next section we're gonna go through is authorization types and follow-up. With medications, completing all the necessary steps to be able to administer therapy to the patient can be complicated. It can be further complicated by insurance companies having similar yet different requirements for coverage on the medical benefit and sometimes different terms for these requirements. In some regions, payers outsource their authorizations to third-party reviewers. So with authorizations, right, you've got two different benefits that you could acquire an authorization on. You've got the medical benefit and the pharmacy benefit, and different things are required for each one of those. So in my background, I come from mostly medical benefit authorizations. And the typical things that I need when I'm calling um, an insurance provider uh, is the doctor's individual MPI number. That's the requesting, who is ordering that medication. But then on the other half of that authorization, I need to know who the servicing, or sometimes they call it dispensing provider is. And that's usually the same provider, right? So I use their MPI number again. If it's through a facility, use the facility's MPI number. And if I'm getting it through a specialty pharmacy, even though this is on the medical benefit, I will need that specialty pharmacy's NPI number. And if you don't have it, a quick search of Google will take care of it. And for the pharmacy benefit, 
the only MPI needed is the requesting provider's individual MPI since it's directly connected to the specialty pharmacy. There are different types of reviews or bundled under one term of pre-service review that can be used for either the medical or the pharmacy benefit. Most commonly, we see these different terms under the medical benefit, but the all-encompassing pre-service review, when you call and someone says no prior auth required, this is a great default term to go to. So pre-service review is one required. This can take a look at medical records. This could be medication history. It could be different pieces and parts, or they need the whole thing. The most common term that everyone knows is prior authorization. Prior authorization literally means that prior to service, you are having the insurance review and authorized treatment. Prior authorization is never a guarantee of payment. It is a pre-service review of those patients' medical records. Predetermination. A predetermination is a little bit different. It is a written submission to the payer to review prior to giving medication. Predetermination um, can take up to 45 days. And I think the hardest part here is most times they're voluntary. And a common mistake is that, oh, it's voluntary, I don't need to do it. It's better to have something than have nothing. So if a predetermination is voluntary, always, always, always take it. Advanced medical review, it can also be known as an advanced benefit determination. This is where, uh, again, you're voluntarily uh, submitting notes, submitting information to a payer to be reviewed. Uh, this is most commonly seen with federal plans, um, your civil service workers who have FEP, things like that. Medical pend is where you can submit records and they can be reviewed where the claim is being held. So this is most commonly done post-service, but what can happen is when you have a medical pend, if you do not submit documentation in a timely manner, you can actually end up losing out on that claim. It can be denied. Authorizations can also be handled by an internal pharmacy department. I know most commonly for those of us on the medical benefit, we're used to calling and asking to speak to utilization management or case management or some of these different department names. But sometimes you get transferred to the pharmacy and their pharmacy team can do both medical and pharmacy benefit. When you're going straight to the medical benefit for provider administered therapies, following a series of questions or a script can be really helpful. Make sure that the patient, your provider, or facility are covered. And this script can vary a little bit, but these are the basic questions that we would strongly recommend you put in place. Number one, is a prior authorization required? Yes, great answer. Complete the PA. No, is a predetermination required? Yes, let's complete that. No, is a pre-service review or advanced benefit determination required? Yes, great, we can do that one too. If no, is this a plan exclusion or a carve out to a specialty pharmacy? Yes, then we triage to the pharmacy benefits. If the answer is no, and you've gone through all those questions, review with the representative on the phone. Ensure that no PA or pre-service review is required. Make sure you ask for their name and a reference number for that call and document, document, document. When calling the insurance company to follow up an authorization status, after it's already been submitted, make sure that you have all patient demographic information available. Locate any reference numbers and other pertinent information. In the prompt menu, you will either need to be routed to authorizations or maybe utilization management. Benefits department will not have this information. Remember, different payers have different terms for these departments. Utilizing pending authorization numbers or reference numbers, you can then ask the representative what the status is. If it's approved, Document that approval information, the dates, the units, the authorization number. Don't forget to ask for a copy of the approval. If it's denied, document your denial reason. Ask about your appeal options. Do you need to submit a letter or a peer-to-peer -peer maybe? An amount of time to complete that appeal. If it's still pending, document that status. Document who you spoke to, why it's still pending, and the amount of time left until the determination is going to be rendered. Important pharmacy benefit information, and these are the authorizations that are handled by the pharmacy benefit manager. When calling the prior authorization number on the back of the insurance card, the representative may state pre-authorizations for this medication is handled by our pharmacy team and I will need to transfer you. When this occurs, just make sure to ask the representative for who the pharmacy benefits manager is that will be handling the prior authorization 
and also a number to contact them directly in case the transfer is unsuccessful. Once you have the rep from the pharmacy prior authorization department on the phone, clarify that the medication is being set up as a pharmacy benefit authorization and not a medical benefit authorization because there's an increasing amount of authorizations that are being handled by the pharmacy team but are actually approvals for the medical benefit. Knowing this information will ensure that you are billing and procuring the medication under the correct pathway. For the pharmacy benefit authorization, after receiving the information, or if you already know that the medication is not covered under the patient's medical benefit, make sure to ask for the name and the number of the pharmacy pre-authorization department. Once you have this information, call the pharmacy pre-authorization department and obtain the PA. After obtaining the PA, make sure to find out who the preferred specialty pharmacy is because the rest of the work is going to be completed with this specialty pharmacy. And once that prior authorization has been approved, you can either e-scribe or send the prescription to the preferred specialty pharmacy for dispensing. And remember that pharmacy benefit managers are the ones who make decisions regarding approvals or denials for prior authorizations, but specialty pharmacies are the ones who dispense and ship the medication to the patient or the provider. Benefit Verification 101. Here's information that will help your practice become proficient in understanding benefits for your patients. Verifying coverage and benefits will help identify potential financial and coverage barriers to care. As more patients become underinsured, knowing if a patient will need copay assistance or prior authorization will help streamline patient care and quicker access to treatment. Some of the important information to have prior to calling is the billing tax ID, the treating physician MPI, the site of care MPI, patient name, date of birth, their insurance ID, group number, the place of service, HCPCS, CPT, and EMM code that will be billed. So when calling in, you're gonna give your name, you're gonna state the place that you're calling from, and the billing tax ID. Then you're gonna go through and ask for in-network or out-of-network with the member's plan. And also, does this member have any deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, or a lifetime maximum? that you need to be aware of before providing treatment. Categories to verify with the payer if you're providing infusions or injectables on site. Couple of them, office visit, in-office injections, infusion administration, where no office visit is being billed, and infusion administration. The short version of benefit verification is that when you call the insurance company that you're building your case, this is where you start by asking everything and anything that could potentially impact your patient and their access to medication. You want to give everything about the physician, the site of care, the medication being administered, and any information on, from the payer around what that looks like. Deductibles, coinsurance, any accumulators that go with this plan, uh, patient assistance, how that will work. Does it need to come from a pharmacy? Are there site of care denials? Are there place of service restrictions or site of care? The goal by verifying all benefits is to make sure that the patient can receive their medication in the most affordable and timely manner. Medications and administration codes for buy and bill. So some really important questions to ask when you're calling the payer. Is the code subject to the deductible or out-of-pocket maximum? Is the code covered under the medical benefit or is it carved out? Is it a pharmacy benefit? Can I buy and bill this? Is a prior authorization required? And when you're asking these questions, you can ask based on the drug name or based on the unclassified code. And I personally recommend asking both. And for my other coders out there, I recommend taking it one step further. J3590 is the most common code that we work with, but J3490 is also an unclassified code. So ask for that payer's code preference when it comes to unclassified drugs. Also ask if there's anything additional you need to submit with your claim when, doing, when using an unclassified code. If the representative asks for that code and they can't find anything in their system, be prepared to spell out both the brand and generic name if need be. If they state that no PA is required for that particular code, ask, follow that checklist again. Is the predetermination required? Is there any kind of voluntary pre-service review? If it's still a no, make sure you document. Make sure you have the date, time you called and the person you spoke to's initials. Most payers have a generic medication PA request that can be filled out. So if you wanna double, triple check, not to create more work for yourselves, but you can use that generic PA request form. Just make sure you really list out the diagnosis and the signature for the prescription. 
when filling out a generic PA form, you can include the unclassified code on there. That way they know what's going to be coming through the billing. Katie, hi, this is Mr. Smith. Hey, I just tried to pick up my medication from the pharmacy, but they're trying to charge me because I have no insurance and it says it won't cover it. I've been on this medication for like five years. What should I do? How can they say no? How can I still get my medicine? New insurance, continuation of therapy. If you've worked in patient care, then you know that come January, there are a handful of patients like Mr. Smith. Not only do new insurance plans come with a new set of benefits that can be different from the year before, but most patients are surprised to learn that their medications are also affected. The sad fact is that even if your doctor has prescribed the same medication for you for several years, a new medication formulary may have the drug classified under a different formulary tier. What is a formulary tier? It's, it is a grouping of medications sorted by different criteria. Those tiers will then act as the indicator of coverage based on the benefit plan. It isn't uncommon to find drugs that are covered in a tier under one plan, but will not be covered in a tier under another plan. And this is where it gets really important for you to take a look at formularies and where medications fall. Different factors are assessed when grouping them into tiers, such as drugs that are costly, have no generic available, or supplied by different distributors. While it may seem hopeless, there is a way around getting prescriptions that fall between these cracks, approved at an in-network rate. Let's talk about tier exception authorizations, which also are known as continuation care authorizations or tier change authorizations. When requesting a tier exception authorization, you can call into the plan and ask what their process is. More than likely, you will need medical records showing how the patient came to be on the medication any and all alternative medications that were tried and failed, the medication pharmacy fill history, a letter of medical necessity from the prescribing physician that describes the ill effects from stopping a patient's long-term medication. If you don't want to reinvent the wheel, there's a high probability that your current medication has a website full of tools that can assist with tier challenges and denials. Most pharmaceutical companies will provide an array of resources to assist both patients and providers with navigating the insurance challenges. Some things to keep in mind. It's important to document with the new plan if applicable. Are there anything that you would add to this? Yeah, I think a lot of times on that medication uh, trial and failures is that they forget to put um, if there's been any um, acute medications given, steroids, things like that, as well as over-the-counter pickups. Um, I know I come from a different background, but over-the-counter medications are really prevalent in our specialty. So making sure that that is well-documented in the patient's chart and medical history as well. And sometimes they don't even have this in there as requirements of trial and failure. So we try to give the payer more information than not. And really what we're trying to do is just make sure that there's no hospitalization or any discontinuation of medication that they've been on. And I think by taping taking those type of steps that we can make sure that there's a better chance to have those medications covered by the insurance company. Are there any other things that you would suggest to, to build a case? I really like to have the support of my provider, whether that's up front with a letter of medical necessity or that's with doing appeal letters or um, peer to peer reviews. But in these cases of tier exceptions, it's great to have not just the original letter of medical necessity, but have a letter of we need to continue treatment. So it's another stance from the physician saying that this really needs to be taken care of. And then you can always appeal to the patient's quality of life. A patient letter is exceptionally helpful in these situations, um, getting their perspective and their point of view and why this is an urgent need for them. Perfect. Hey advocates, it's Elizabeth from Namapa. Just wanted to remind you to come visit us at the Healthcare Advocate Summit later this year. We're bringing together advocates to talk about all the things that go into our journeys. Patients, copay assistants, manufacturer hubs, and other barriers to access and treatment. So please be sure to check out the Healthcare Advocate Summit. We can't wait to see you there. We'd love to be able to talk all things medication access and patient advocacy. See you guys soon.